Welcome to Dan DJ. I'm taking more risky aspects of crypto and digital assets and trying to find the next 10 to 100x gem. So today we're talking about a project, as I like to call it, the kingpin of DPIN. Now, the narrative for decentralized physical infrastructure network is playing out right now. I think it will be big, but you have to understand that with DPIN or any other business out there, it has to do a couple of things. And this is from Brian Tracy, a great author. And he states it very, you know, marvelously here. He says, all wealth comes from adding value, producing more, cheaper, faster, easier. And even though you have the narrative there and it sounds good, as we go through this presentation and talk about minutes, I want you to remember that. Is this cheaper, faster, and easier? And what does it actually do? So to break that down, we're going to use the tried and true method uh, over here at Dan DGen and say, will it make the cut? And the cut stands for Community Utility Team Tokenomics. And we'll break those four sectors down and we'll start with utility. So first of all, DPIN works out pretty well if you can eliminate the middleman or eliminate costs and actually do good things for businesses to improve their bottom line. Now, here's a question for you. What would you rather do as far as, far as like for infrastructure? Would you rather have and take all the money to build a warehouse? to have all the permits and all the cash flow and everything else it actually takes to pay the taxes, to pay the people. And then not only that, when you build that infrastructure, now you have to fill it up with any kind of uh, CPUs, with uh, individuals, with employees, with wiring, electricity, and all the different costs. Or would you just say this, why don't I just give somebody a token? And we're going to use their computational power on their computers or whatever else it is. And we're going to eliminate that, that middle part and we're going to pay people. This is being done with Akash. This is being done with HyperCycle, Theta, Render, Filecoin, and Arweave for essentially cloud services. And also for like rendering of, of AI and different uh, services through uh, DPIN. So what would you rather do? Would you rather do that? Or how about for telecommunications? Would you rather do something like with Helium and just say, hey, uh, instead of us putting up a uh, uh, telecom tower and spending millions of dollars and then also the permits and the people that actually have to do it and the electricity and the time and then also the upkeep, why don't we just tell people this? Hey, why don't you buy a node and then uh, you can run it and we'll pay in the token. This is done pretty well for Helium, also done for World Mobile Token as well. Now take that to the calling sector, telecommunications and actually connecting people together. This is actually how it works. So let's say you have Verizon and uh, you want to make a call to somebody on another carrier. It, it could be to Verizon or it could be T-Mobile. There are these individuals in the middle, and they are the wholesale voice communications market. And essentially what they are doing is they are connecting you to another individual. Now, when you pay that uh, for these services, especially if we're talking about international calls, Verizon gets a cut, T-Mobile gets a cut, even if they're, they're one sector, another sector, because you have to pay for that. But the people in the middle, they're making roughly $251 billion annually. So if you're a Verizon and T-Mobile and, Ver and uh, just think to yourself, why am I doing this? Well, it's the only thing, it's the only game in town. And it's been, a, been around for decades. And this, I think, is ripe for disruption. What if you just do this? What if you just eliminate these, these middlemen, right? And you could take all the apps on somebody's phone, insert two lines of code, bake some uh, nodes, and uh, it's very easy to operate that. Just download some software and then pay everybody in a token and make it 80 to 90% less expensive, thereby eliminating the middle people. Now, Verizon and T-Mobile and all the different carriers, they're still going to get their little cut. But if they can reduce that $251 billion, I think it's a home run. And that is what Menace Network does. And we're going to break that down. So what's great about this right now, it has a real working product. You can check it out right now. There's a link in the description. And they're doing a case study right now in India and Bangladesh, and they're connecting people and making it super ridiculously cheap and showing all their potential investors and all the people they're going to partner with and going, look, you can keep going with the old way or you can get with the new way. And it's the same thing with, uh, t with World Mobile. They're doing the exact same thing and showing people like, hey, we have a real working product. This is actually connecting people for telecommunications. And the reason I bring both of these up is you're going to see a partnership in a little bit, and we'll get to that in a second. But before we break it all down, you're going to hear some terminology. And this kind of threw me th through a loop. So I wanted to make sure that you understand that. When these people, and, I, and you can take a look at the white paper or the websites, or we're going to get in and we're going to talk to Josh Watkins. Is he going to give us a, 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 a rundown on this? When people talk about termination in the telecommunications business, my first thought was, okay, you're hanging up the phone. It doesn't make any sense. But termination is very simple. You got a, somebody who's making a call, someone who's receiving a call. 
the call origination is the person that's making it and the call termination or the terminal end, that is the terminal or the termination of the service. So you're actually just connecting people. So if you ever hear termination, just substitute that with connection. That's pretty much what it is. And again, taking a look at two lines of code in the apps with the nodes and the uh, tokens themselves. So getting back to it, the question you might have is, well, Rob, why would these apps even have those two lines of uh, code inserted into their program? What's in it for them? If I'm a, an, an app operator or some app that I made for whether that be gaming or fitness or, or con connectivity or whatever else it is that you have on your phone, why would I allow two lines of code? Even though it's less expensive, and everybody's happy about that. It's very simple. So let me get paid. So the whole thing is this. If you are an app on a phone, and of course you have your revenue stream and whatever else it is, it would probably behoove you just to add a couple of lines of code and you get paid if somebody uses that phone to terminate or connect with somebody else out there. So if I'm an app, I'm like, hey, there's another way to do this. I don't have to you know, shove ads down people's throats or do something special. I can just add two lines of code and get paid. I will do that. And they'll do that and they'll actually reduce the overall cost of 80% because they're eliminating the middleman. And that's where the code comes in and everything else. So again, any app that carries the minutes network two lines of code equals increased revenue. Can't say that uh, enough. And that's any app. That could be an app that's in retail, that's commercial, that could also be in government. So even if it's an app with Medicare, NHS, TSA, IRS, I know people say, oh, I never have those. Well, some people do. But if you have those, you can partner up with the government and go, how would you like to increase your revenue instead of the fact of taxing everybody? They'll probably go for it. And we're actually going to talk to a regulator and a little bit later in the video. And I'm going to show you why governments will actually do this because the regulators are already on board. So that takes care of the first part. But I just want to make mention of this. We are re-releasing the classic game Flappy Bird. It had 90 million downloads in 2014. We think it'll be a pretty big hit on Web 2 and Web 3. It'll be 100% free to play on Web 2 and 3. We'll get into that later but we will be a partner of Minutes Network because we feel like decentralized is the way and we can eliminate middlemen. So again, if we're an app, we just have two lines of code, why wouldn't we do that? And like I said here, a download of Flappy Bird is a download for decentralization. There's another caveat to this though. Think of this way. Well, with all these things that are going through and then of course voice communication, but Rob, I just use WhatsApp and I just contact anybody in the world and I just use that app itself. Well, you can do that and there's no costs and it is free, but the person that you're contacting also has to have WhatsApp, which isn't very difficult, I must, I must admit. However, with WhatsApp, of course, there's a little bit of a data tracking thing. It's a little bit more centralized. And of course, nobody's really making any funds right there, except for the almighty Zuck. So that's just one aspect of it. And these types of OTT and, or voice over internet protocol are not going to go away. I'm just saying that there's some people that don't have those types of uh, apps and they're connected both ways, especially if you're calling into businesses internationally, you're gonna need this service of Minutes Network. So again, everything we just talked about, think about what Brian Tracy said. All wealth comes from adding value, producing more, cheaper, faster, and easier. Is that what's happening? I think it actually is. So we understood this first part about the apps. Let's break into the second part as far as nodes. And it says here, calls are terminated, again, connected, directly via mobile applications through validation nodes and switch nodes. What the heck is that? Let's break this down and make it super simple. You got two types of nodes, validation nodes, 2,500 of those, and 500 of switch nodes. So let's talk about the validation nodes. This is the easiest way to understand it. Think of it this way. Validation nodes, they host, check, and synchronize the blockchain. You've got nodes all over the place. One of the biggest examples you can think of is probably Bitcoin. So essentially, it's a distributed ledger technology, or DLT. If you've ever seen something like this, it's just a ledger. That's all it is, and it's just verifying all the transactions within the blockchain. And that's essentially validation nodes, and they are going to do that throughout the Minutes Network to validate everything is correct as it goes through the blockchain and all the different transactions that are on that. So validation nodes, very simple to understand. They host, check, and synchronize the blockchain, make sure everything's on the up and up. So that makes sense. Now let's talk about the other nodes, which are called switch nodes. And switch nodes, Essentially what they do is they activate those two lines of code within those apps. It allows the minutes network to terminate, again, connect 72 million minutes of calls per day. And again, you can see here, so you have the lines of, of code on the app. Someone says, I wanna make a call. 
these guys will connect them together and then off it goes and it's, it's terminated or connected. And the easiest way I can think about talking about this would be like the old school days of the telecom operators where they were just like, oh, you wanna connect, here you go. And they would punch in these buttons or they would c connect these wires. It's an older way of thinking, but of course, that's just how I kind of uh, uh, see things. That's what these node operators or these switch network operators are actually doing. And if you wanna be a part of that, you can. So here's how it works. If you wanna be a switch node or a validation node operator, what do you need? Do you need to physically be there? Well, obviously not, that was just an example. What you need is a computer. And all this is the requirements, 2.4 Intel computer, CPU. You need a hard drive, you need eight gigabytes, eight gigabytes of RAM, you need internet access. And this is the great part, you don't need technical knowledge. All you gotta do is be able to download a piece of software. Node program installed in a few clicks at the portal. So when you, we go through the process and we get the tokens and you, if you wanna get a node, very simple. All you do is you go to the Minutes Network website on the upper right hand corner, it's gonna say MNT portal, you're gonna click on that. Once you click on that in the lower left hand corner, it says management, switch nodes, validation nodes. You're gonna click on that, it's gonna download the software, it takes four to five clicks and you're done. All you gotta do is make sure you have a computer and make sure it's up and then you'll be part of the whole process and you'll be able to gain revenue in Minutes Network token, depending on what kind of node that you actually choose. But there is one caveat, switch nodes, 500, 2500, there's a threshold to stake and to actually be available to get one of those nodes, it was going to take 10,000 MNT tokens, which lucky for you, the token generation event hasn't even happened. It's gonna happen in quarter two of 2024. And right now we're only in quarter one, we're in March of 2024. So it takes 10,000 of minutes network tokens and there's gonna be 2,500 up for grabs. Now, if you wanna be a switch node operator, you have to have 50,000 tokens and it's 500 switch nodes. If you'd like to go that route, or if you're like, you know what, I just want to invest into this and I want, I, I see it has real world utility. I'm just gonna stake the token. I don't wanna be a switch node operator or a validation node operator. It's up to you and I will show you the form at the very end. So again, if you were a switch node or validation, this is what you get paid. So again, you get 30% uh, reward pool and that's in switch or validation. Of course you get uh, more because there's only 500 nodes for the switch and validation or 2500. But as a reminder, uh, there's an algorithmic burn. So 50% is actually being burned and then 30% goes to uh, all the stake pool operators or validation switch nodes. So that makes it uh, very easy. No matter what you do, if it's just about uh, investing into the tokens itself or you wanna become a node operator, sure. But just know that we're looking to get into a 251 billion voice calling market, just like the, well, the previous slide that we showed. And that's going to only expand to 2030, and it's going to grow at 15%. So you're looking at another 200 uh, to 270 billion north of that. And if you take a look at just the top cryptos all the way to 100, as far as a market cap goes, look at this. Uh, Blur is number 87. I don't know what that is. It has a billion dollar market cap. Gala, 987 million. Uh, Ronin, 949, and then on and down it goes to all the way to EOS, 879 million, that's number 100. So if we're taking a look and thinking to ourselves, wow, you know, what could actually be, is, this, is there really a market for it? Yes, I think there actually is. So now that we've talked about the utility, let's just quickly talk about the tokenomics. So the tokenomics, it's uh, the MNT, the Minutes Network token tokenizes bandwidth and distributes value to Minutes Network participants. There's three levels to it. First of all, there's the Ethereum layer. This is the distribution section of it. This is where they actually are going to be uh, for rewards to network participants. And the middle part is AYA. AYA, if you are a world mobile token node operator, or if you dabbled in world mobile token, AYA is a side chain for Cardano. And this will be for the call detail records, transparency, and a cost efficient processing and settlement layer. And lastly, will be the rollups, and of course, that'll be layer twos. And this will be for a trust layer, stores the hash and can extend the public L2 blockchain. So essentially, they're gonna use these three levels for everything that has to do with Minutes Network token. Also in tokenomics, we need to know well, how does this actually generate revenue? So again, Minutes Network generates revenue by terminating, connecting voice traffic for international carriers. And again, what we talked about, two lines of code goes to the nodes and they connect. 
Minus Network uh, buys the MNT tokens on the open market and sends them to the reward pool. That would be uh, all the node operators and everybody who's staking. The rewards are distributed in the form of MNTs to network participants. That would be a node operators. And it would also be the apps, whether that be just a regular retail app, government app, commercial app, doesn't matter, or of course, Flappy Bird. And that's what they'll be paid in as far as MNT. And now if we're gonna take a look at the distribution, as far as like uh, tokenomics, the total supply is 500 million tokens. And to visualize that, here's how it all breaks down. Total supply is 500 million. So what we see here is that private sale, that's two and a half percent, very small amount. It's a 12 and a half million. And at TGE, the token generation event, when they actually create the tokens, 100% will be available for the people that got into the, the seed, the pre-seed and the private rounds. And that's 100% at that time frame. But the public sale, which is us, that'll be at 10%, which is 50 million tokens. And at the TGE, the token generation event, 100% will be up and available for people to do whatever they want to. They can buy some more, sell or hold what they want to do. Now we get into the other bigger parts, network expansion. Of course, that'll be like the rewards and things like that. Looking at almost 50% or 227 million. And what's interesting about this, for network expansion, advisors, operations, and team, it is unlocked over 60 months. So at the TGE, only between 0 0.25, 0.06%, it's very small amounts as time goes on, but it is for 60 months or five years. So every month, a little bit gets unlocked and a little bit and a little bit. And to, take a, to visually take a look at that, it would look like this. Again, public sale, which is us, it's 10%. That'll be 100% available at TGE. Private sales, same thing, but a very small amount of tokens. Operations, advisors, expansion, team, and founders. That will be the other piece, which is a lot, but it's released over 60 months. So for me, I think this is a, a good way to do tokenomics. All right. Then to finish up, community. And we can see that uh, I think community is, of course, the socials, but it's also the partnerships that they have. So Minutes Number partnered recently with IDT Corporation. That's a telecom business which has over 100 million international telephone calls annually. Revenue is 1.346 billion, not too shabby. They're also with World Mobile, like we talked about. So with World Mobile, it's about connecting the unconnected using the node or the earth nodes, which we are actually one of the earth node operators. They use the aerostats or people call them blimps. They can communicate and, and connect people all the way throughout a very vast amount of mileage uh, around the region. There's an app that they download and they're paid in World Mobile token and connects them and they have a real working product, which is why we're excited about it. And then of course for their socials, uh, they've got over 70,000 between their X account, between YouTube, between Telegram and Discord. So from day one, since Minutes Network is uh, actually connected with World Mobile, and we'll get to why that is in the interview, but uh, they're gonna not start from scratch and they already have this already going. So it'll be like one for one. With the connections and the people that are coming in, there is another integration and partnership that I cannot talk about, but this will be released in the next month. And it is a very big telecommunications corporation and they have 1.2 billion users and they just ain't the deal. And why? It's because it's better, stronger, easier, and cheaper and they're going to eliminate essentially that middleman. So we'll talk about that as soon as we are uh, allowed to. to. Get into the team team. Uh, they've got uh, multiple people on here. And I asked Josh Watkins, who's the CEO, I said, for all these people that are on your on your board, would you say it's over a hundred plus years of, uh, of experience via telecommunications? And he said, easily. So what's great about this team is that they're strong, they know what they're doing, they've worked in telecommunications for decades, and that's why they're bringing this to market because they figured out that there was a huge problem, it's ripe for disruption, and they're going to capitalize it and starting soon, actually this year. And then one of those will be Nisa, Nisa Purcell. She's one of the regulators we, I was alluding to in the beginning. She's a regulator for the government of Samoa, acting secretary general for two years, at the CT or the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization or CTO and Director, ICT Development. Before working for the CTO, she worked at the ITU as the head of the ICT Development Team, Emergency Telecommunication Stuff. And what is ITU? ITU is an interesting international organization. It's committed to connecting all the world's people wherever they live and whatever their means. That's a pretty good partnership. And to really break this down, ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. Organization made up of membership of 193 member states and more than 900 companies, universities, and international 
and regional organizations. So to say that NISA has a little bit of experience is an understatement. And as a matter of fact, I actually sat down with NISA and Josh Watkins, and we're going to do a quick interview. It's about 10 minutes. So they want to bring the founders in and, of course, advisors, and just to really get a grasp of what's going on. It's about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, 35 uh, over 35 years experience in the in the sector and uh, in 2003 well I'm going to talk only about the last 20 years my mm -hmm. government um, uh, requested that I come back I was living in New Zealand at the time and help reform telecommunication um, in Samoa it was uh, our Prime Minister who uh, rang me in New Zealand so I came and um, yes, um, did the, worked on the reform, led to the uh, development of the uh, first ever national ICT uh, policy. Then of course, liberalizing the mobile market and um, look at uh, doing the technical review of the um, uh, legislation, telecommunication mm -hmm. legislation 2005. And um, after everything was done in Samoa, including uh, guidelines for setting up the regulatory office, then uh, it was time to move on. And then uh, after that, um, I was appointed at, as head of ICT development for the developing countries, especially LDCs, which mm -hmm. is least developed, uh, developed countries, small island developing states, landlocked countries. And this was part of my job. Uh, next one, I worked for the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization mm -hmm. as ICT uh, director. And then uh, two months after that, uh, the executive officer, uh, executive committee rather, appointed me as the acting uh, secretary general at that time. Then when COVID uh, hits, I mm -hmm. applied for the uh, regulator position in Samoa and I came back in mm -hmm. 2020. Thank you. That is his uh, fantastic resume, and uh, I'm glad you're here. So, Josh, this will be uh, now for you. Now, of course, you being here with uh, Menace Network, Josh, just give us a little bit of background because I know your team, you guys have a lot of experience, but yourself, uh, you know, where, how did you get here? So, I started in telecommunications very early. Um, obviously, after the inception of VoIP, uh, we started out building soft switches, building hardware switches, looking at different models of termination across countries. Um, we worked with you know tier three, tier two, tier one carriers across the globe, uh, primarily interconnecting originating traffic from carriers to terminating carriers. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done hundreds of minutes of uh, millions of minutes in uh, in our relationships over the last sort of twenty years. Um, and, and we've continued to build and we've made different codecs that are sort of audio, improving audio quality and we've made different protocols. Um, we've played with different options and we've seen sort of the voice over IP industry inside and out over the last 20 years. And when I say we, I'm talking as a family. We ran this business uh, as a family group operation with my brother, Mickey. Um, and, and we've been, you know, working in voice over IP ever since we were very, very small. Um, and, and it's something that's brilliant. Uh, it's borderless. It allows, you know, it's, it's license free in most countries. It allows you to operate uh, between countries, perform interconnections on paid for calls from, from voice carriers. And uh, it really took my interest. It's a passion of mine. We love the industry. Yeah. And now here we are with minutes. So fantastic. That's a good intro. So let's get into it, shall we? So it's interesting how things have changed, and especially as we take a look at DPIN and decentralization and blockchain technology. The question I have, though, is VOIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol, and, and OTT, which is kind of like with uh, WhatsApp, the online communication stuff. This actually changed telecom quite some time ago. So what are the challenges right now facing the national and international carries? Because back then, I mean, that was that was a huge step up. And now here we are, VOIP and OTT. So so what are the challenges? And of course, this this is open to either uh, Nisa or Josh, whoever wants to take this question. Sure. So I'll begin. And if Nisa would like to lead off, you know, further, further in the conversation, that's fine. The challenge is today, primarily a carrier when it comes to voice termination, they're looking for a good rate. And when I say rates, I mean rate per minute. So how termination works, it's like I make a call to somebody else. There's a rate per minute of my connection time. 
uh, and, and carrier A bills carrier B. So carriers in the voice section of their business, they're looking for cheap minutes, okay? So if you can get a, a cheaper minute, it means you're making a higher margin. It means that company is making more profit. The shareholders are happy. You know, the bosses are happy. Everybody's happy if the company's making more profit. So one of the major challenges, apart from the rate, is the inception of OTT. Um, products like WhatsApp have come and allowed you to call for free, okay? So they've really taken quite a large share of the minutes out of the market, out of the paid for market. Whereas usually, you know, uh, 15 years ago, we'd pick up the telephone and we'd dial an international call to speak to somebody abroad. Now you're picking up WhatsApp, you're picking up Skype, we're on stream, you know, it's there's different solutions and they're over the top solutions and, and they've damaged the carrier's profitability because they've come into the market, they've offered a free service peer to peer. As long as both users have the application, they'll connect the call for free. And why, you know, that's why carriers really appreciate us. When we talk to carriers and we offer them a, a lower rates per minute, it means now they are making more profit once again, right? And, and we're not talking 1% lower. You know, our unique engineering, our proprietary engineering allows you to actually set the rate, you know, that we sell. So, I mean, we control our own rates in the market, unlike any other carrier today. So everybody is losing. Uh, not only carriers are losing money, the governments are losing money, and uh, the consumers are losing money because who is um, paying? Who is paying the cost um, to use OTT and VoIP? It's the consumer. The consumer has to pay data every day from the carriers because without that, they they can't use it. Got it. Excellent. Okay. So everybody, thank you for that one. So then the, I guess I will leave you to the next question, which very simply is this. Well, how does Minutes Network fit into VOIP and OTT? Because if we're talking about losing revenue, uh, as far as like with the governments, how does that fit into it? And of course, anybody can lead off on this question. What we do is we take a call from a tier one carrier that's paid for. And in our hybrid solution, we terminate that call directly as a peer to the end user via the application and we reinvigorate the application's profit we reinvigorate the carrier's profit okay because we're monetizing for the application by monetizing the user base okay so so we're paying them on each call connected and um, we take the you know the, a good rate to the carrier and the carrier gets a reinvigorated rate he's happy to work with us any carrier any size because we are able to offer a custom rate and this solution doesn't exist today. Um, we have this solution ready. It's running right now. I have about 40,000 users and, and growing every day. And we're already running a test bed with 20 million users that is preparing to be launched by the end of Q2, which is super exciting and, and, and uh, right, which will drive the buyback to the company and it will drive, I mean, it's, it's real world revenue coming in from these carriers. We're, we're not talking about, uh, millions of dollars here right it's it's a it's a large figure large figure you know what so that would um that would lead me to and this would go directly to nisa to answer this next question then because josh just kind of laid it out and like how this kind of fits into it but first of all like are the regulators and the governments going to want to work with it and that's this is one of my concerns because with what we see here in the states with the SEC and Gary Genzo, they do not want to work with exchanges. They do not want to work with decentralized companies. They just don't. So, Anissa, for you, how did because you're in government and you're in regulation, first of all, why did you decide to work with Minutes Network? And will do you think this will actually go through for governments and regulators? Yes, uh, I, I believe so, because this issue of OTT, um, has been discussed uh, at the international level for a very long time. And although, and while the ITU Treaty on International Telecommunication Regulations, or ITR, um, with regards to net neutrality and the standards uh, to telecommunications, um, the, the, the onus was given to the countries or member states to use as appropriate according to their telecom to telecommunication acts so this is why i'm excited about um, minutes network because as i mentioned before government was losing money everyone was losing money so with this 
the, it will um, it will be an added revenue to governments. So there is an incentive there for regulators and for governments uh, to do this. Um, regulators have been looking for ways on how to regulate OTTs and VoIP. And um, it has been very difficult, but with the Minutes Network um, uh, initiative or product, this is the way forward. And furthermore, we need to, to bridge this gap because a lot of people in the world, especially those living um, in rural areas, pre still prefer voice calling. Why? Because number one, it's um they are used to it or mm -hmm. trying to learn to use to it and secondly is that those people cannot afford smartphones i know for a fact um, in my country and in other pacific island countries we still have 2g because a mm -hmm. lot of people prefer uh voice and it's the same as uh least developed countries in africa and all the other parts of the world so while the developed countries are now sunsetting 2G, 3G already, um, developing world, the developing countries are still using 2G. I mean, as a regulator, how can I, how can I uh, sunset 2G when people um, cannot afford to buy um, smartphones? So this is why I am very excited about this. So it means that um, it will benefit uh, government and will also help the regulators regulate um, OTTs. Thank you. Got it. So excellent response. So I guess that would be, I mean, you know, just piggybacking off that. So we know this looks like something that could be really great for a lot of different countries, but then you have to kind of work your way into these tier one carriers because if they don't want to do it, then, you know, where are we? So the question then is, you know, how much progress have you made there as far as convincing these T1 carriers to work with Minutes Network as opposed to working with the standalone be all the ones in the past? And of course, this could be Josh or Nisa, whoever wants to take this one. Sure. So we've made significant process. Um, we, we've onboarded a company called IDT. IDT are a large company. They aggregate a huge panel of different interconnects uh, ranging from Verizon to I don't know, you can go to idt.net and you can see all of the different carriers that have been onboarded until now. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really interesting company. They've been around for a very long time and they have, a, as you can see on the screen, a, a significant amount of yearly revenue. Um, we will obviously be competing for a fair portion of that revenue as we will uh, for, for other providers in the, in the business. Um, we're mostly looking at aggregators, people who aggregate lots of traffic. We recently made a partnership um, public with, with a company called Next Communications, who also aggregate uh, you know, hundreds of carriers across the world, including the likes of Telecom Italia, Telefonica, and we'll be servicing all of those providers proxy our aggregators. Um, we obviously have you know, relationships with Labara and Skype, and, and you can just check our website for, for the process so far. Um, in the very near future, we'll be announcing some very large household names as, as partnerships and relationships uh, for interconnection and, and uh, cool termination. I should just mention on the last point that because we um, because because we can terminate telephone calls via applications, governmental applications also have the opportunity to work with Minutes Network. And what that allows is um, the government, because we don't have it, you know traditional infrastructure costs, because we don't have traditional licensing costs, because we're borderless, you know, because of our design, unique design. And because we capture all of the call revenue, because we have no B leg to pay due to the way that we're terminating the calls, um, this allows governments to make a revenue sharing deal on any governmental application. And we, we're talking to a few right now. I'm not going to announce any names, but we've got mm -hmm. more than, you know, we, we've got two, two or three governments that are heavily interested in our product. And, and they're interested because it makes a significant revenue for the government. And by design, we reward the people. I mean, all network participants are rewarded at Minutes Network, whether you're a switch node owner or whether you're validating the network you know, by owning a validation node, um, you're rewarded. But if you're, a, if you're a caller or a callee, you're also rewarded. And the governments are interested um, in giving something back to their people as well. I think it's uh, very important to note, right? So we cover all the angles. 
we, we re reinvigorate everybody who's involved in the model. And it doesn't matter who's providing that application, whether it's a governmental application or a privately owned application. Uh, in either way, that there's a profit share going on there as well. So, I mean, just all parties are happy. And, and to further answer your initial question, carriers are super happy to work with us because we provide the lowest rate in the market, guaranteed. And we can only do that thanks to the software that we've built. Yeah, cheaper, faster, simpler. That's what everybody wants. That's what, everybody, that's what every business wants so they can grow revenue. It makes a lot of sense. So let's finish up with this because we talked about the the great stuff, let's bring it home and uh, really kind of dig deep, which is how big can this be and what are your roadblocks? We love to talk about how great it can be and, and we know it can be great, but the thing is what is going to stymie that and hold Minutes Network back from reaching its full potential? I think the the uh, key roadblocks um, is um, making governments believe that this is something um, mm -hmm. that is going to be great for them because mm -hmm. uh, it's going to bring back, I mean, every government uh, looking for revenue. And, um, and this is um, where uh, it's important to have uh, to, for Minutes Network to work through the regulators because regulators are the very people that uh, do advise government and within their legislation, that is their responsibility is to introduce uh, in um, uh, the uh, new way of using um, digital tra uh, transformation to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, so, it's really convincing the government that yes, this is something that uh, that is part of your of their digital transformation strategy, because every country is talking about every um, digital transformation. Developed countries, yes, they are moving way ahead, but mm -hmm. developing countries they're still lagging behind, and this will be um, one uh, roadblock. Um, with the project. So we need to really do this and we need to strategize and uh, give strategies uh, for the governments. Got it. Well, it comes out of this. Excellent response. It's not about what you know, it's who you know. And I think there's a lot That's of context true. in there. So everybody uh, who is watching this video, the, everything we talked about today, there are links in the description. So I want to, again, thank uh, uh, Nisa Purcell and Josh Watkins for coming by and answer those questions. Thank you guys so much for stopping by the show. Thank you so much, Rob. Thanks for having us. All right, All right everybody, let's jump back. So again, I want to thank Josh and Nisa for sitting down with me and explaining this in simple terms. It was uh, eye-opening to say the least. So there's a link in the description. And you can join the MNT token generation event. And this is just information. They are looking to do this in quarter two. So we're looking at April, May, June, 2024. You can fill out this form and you can get updates. I'll be talking about this because I will also be an investor in this project. Before you do that, though, let's finish this up with a little pros and cons of the MNT. So first of all, the pros. It's real utility. It actually does really something. It's actually disrupting an entire network and, or an organization. And uh, I think it could be, do really well. Number two, it's got huge partnerships. We took a look at IDT and there's one with 1.2 billion individual customers. And uh, when we can release that, I will let you know. Number three, they have a very strong team, massive experience, uh, probably one of the biggest ones I've seen so far. And it's in an industry that's ripe for disruption and cost savings, like we talked about. For the wholesale operators, they've been doing this for decades. And of course, costs have gone down a little bit, but 251 billion, that's a lot of change that could really uh, be ripe for disruption. And the last one is even the regulators and governments can get behind this one. We know we just heard Nisa talk about it as to why they want to do that. And to me, it makes sense. So those are the pros and it's pretty heavy. But if we're going to talk about the pros, let's talk about the cons themselves. The cons. It's real utility. And I said this twice, and you'll probably scratch and you're like, why does that make any sense? It's because of this. Because in the crypto and digital asset space, it seems like some of these projects that don't do anything, meme coins come to mind, old legacy type of cryptos have been creeping around since 2013, 2012, they do nothing. 
and they just live in this top 100 for some reason. And it seems like we kind of ignore the projects that actually are ripe for change and can actually do something. And I think, and as we talked about this before, in the digital asset space, really it comes down to speculation, hype, and greed. And some of these products that are do really great things are overlooked. So that's why I, I feel like sometimes it's a con. But I would be amiss if I didn't mention that, of course, it is a deep pin narrative and everybody's gonna love that, so we'll see. Second big con is this, bigger companies could duplicate. Let's be honest, uh, two lines of code, and of course they've got a lot of uh, you know big experience with their team, but a bigger company could come along and just say, you know what, we're just gonna duplicate this code, we're gonna make our own nodes, and we're gonna really just run with it. However, first mover advantage, and and who knows, maybe another bigger company comes in and and gobbles them up and uh, you know pays for that, like what they do, and we'll see what happens. But for right now, uh, they have first mover advantage and we'll see how it works. And that's big for us. Number three, you got to convince these apps to be to onboard, which it could be challenging because some of the apps are like, I don't trust you. I don't know you, especially some of the bigger apps that are on your phone, whatever those may be. So they have their work cut out for them. I mean, when we saw this, we thought it was a no brainer for Flappy Bird. So we signed up immediately, but it might be challenging for some and uh, they don't have to get every one of them, but I can see a roadblock there. Number four, there's no hype. Um, like we just talked about, as far as speculation and greed and of course hype itself. I mean, no one's really talking about this right now. So uh, just like we talked about with uh, one of our last projects, if there's no hype around it, it'll be very difficult to push it. I think people will be interested in it and it might be enormous, but right now this is where we're at. And lastly, it's risky and growing pains because you know, this is very new just like all the different products that we talk about on this channel. So if we think like, oh, this is a slam dunk and it's so easy, we have to be aware that these are new things coming out and everything has risk with it. That's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about here is pretty risky stuff on Dan Degen, but we think there are different opportunities out there and it's up to you to decide what's best for yourself. But that's it. So thanks so much for stopping by, I appreciate it. Give me a thumbs up and a like on the way out and subscribe. See you on the next one.